Michael O'Boyle is a biological scientist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. He has a master's degree in marine biology. His love of marine science began as a boy during family visits to Naples, and he moved here in 2012. For the last decade, he has studied Florida's Gulf Coast marine fisheries for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. He has used underwater cameras to assess fish populations and sonar to map the sea floor of the eastern Gulf of Mexico. He co-manages field operations in southwest Florida with the Stone Crab Research Program. All right, I'm a biologist for uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife. I've worked for FWC for uh, over six years now, nearly seven years. Uh, and this kind of work has allowed me to study a variety of fisheries in both nearshore estuaries as well as offshore. Um, and I work with one other biologist as a stone crab biologist. Um, his name is Thomas Paulson. And together we oversee um, research efforts in the Southwest Florida region for the stone crab group. And as you can see from the title, I use terms both research and monitoring. And we all heard the term research, but not everybody knows what monitoring is. So what is monitoring? Uh, monitoring refers to um, collecting data using the same research methods over a very long time series to reveal trends in a species population. Okay, so in short, I'm going to talk kind of about how we collect data um, for FWC with stone crabs um, and what we've learned about stone crabs as a species. So I'm going to keep this talk pretty light as well um, and try to keep it approachable rather than dive too much into data or uh, current management issues. My goal really here is to kind of educate you guys about stone crabs in a well-rounded way. Uh, so you have as much context as possible as to why uh, the state collects data on these animals the way that we do. So I'm going to first just talk a little bit about the commercial fishery um, and then how, you know, how they fish for stone crabs. Then I'll go into some biology and life history of the species. Uh, then I'll start to dive into uh, what the stone crab, stone crab monitoring program actually looks like, how the program's set up, um, and then uh, the methods we use to collect that data. Um, finally, I'll end on some new and exciting projects that we've been working on. So the stone crab fishery occurs primarily on Florida's west coast, and it's pretty unique in the southeastern U.S. because um, the harvesters don't actually harvest the entire crab. So they actually only harvest uh, legal sized claws at sea, and then they return the uh, declawed crabs into the water alive. So this is an offshore fishery, meaning that you won't see any of these crab traps in backwater estuaries. Um, those are usually blue crab traps and they're marked differently. Uh, however, you will see them sometimes just off the beach, uh, and you may also see them 20 or more miles offshore. Um, most stone crab landings come from our southwest regions in uh, Naples, Fort Myers, uh, a little further north, and also the Keys region. And uh, these are the regions that have also been fished for the longest. Um, and stone crab landings were actually highest in the 1990s. Uh, and unfortunately, they, they've been on a steady decline since then. So stone crabs, what I find really interesting is that they're originally just considered bycatch in the Florida Keys spiny lobster fishery. However, markets actually developed in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, and since 1992, uh, Florida's stone crab have been the third most valuable fishery in Florida, surpassing um, only shrimp, or uh, just behind shrimp and spiny lobster, excuse me. So let's get into some of the, uh, the trap specifications, how these animals are, are really fished. So stone crab traps, uh, they can be wood or plastic. Um, uh, it's kind of on personal preference by commercial crabbers. So you have this, uh, this box essentially, and the box uh, has a concrete slab on the bottom of it. And that's what weighs it down when it's dropped into the water and it kind of suctions to the bottom. Um, and then a buoy is a trap or, or is attached to the trap on, on a long uh, line. Then there's also a tag affixed to the trap to identify the owner. Um, and that has uh, very specific um, requirements as well that I won't get into. Um, and then you'll see on the top here, there's this kind of oblong shape that's called the throat. 
And this is how the stone crabs enter the trap when it's on the bottom. So in this picture, you can see a stone crab, um, stone crab trap on the bottom, a line tending upward. And that's pretty much how the trap will be oriented because that concrete slab keeps that hole up uh, facing the top of the water column. Um, and then um, perhaps most importantly, if you look at the uh, diagram on the left, you'll see um, that tan square or rectangle rather. Uh, and that is a, a, what's called a slat and it's biodegradable and it deteriorates over time. And so uh, if this trap gets lost due to weather or if a boat runs over the buoy uh, and that trap happens to stay in the water, that slat deteriorates. And then those crabs uh, that couldn't otherwise escape can get through that slat. So that, that's a very important piece to this whole, to this whole thing. Uh, finally, um, a regulation was put in place that will go into effect in the 2023-2024 crabbing season. Um, the presence of a uh, escape ring will be required in all plastic and wooden traps. Um, and you can see it right here, this little circle. And the reason for this is it's thought to reduce uh, bycatch of sublegal uh, juvenile crabs. So uh, rather than pulling up all these crabs that the crabbers can't harvest anyway, this allows them to escape and uh, without any of the stress of being caught. Um, so the last thing I want to say about this is that commercial traps, when you see them offshore, they're placed in these very long rows called lines and they'll contain um, sometimes up to a hundred traps in a single line. Um, and the stone crabbers may move further inshore or offshore um, and a sample a variety of depths uh, to help them figure out where the crabs are throughout the season because uh, it's been long believed that these crabs actually move great distances. And so crabbers and us biologists are constantly trying to figure out where they're holding. Okay, so uh, the size of a stone crab claw is considered to be what's called the length of the propotis. So uh, the propotis marked here, um, the, you measure the uh, beginning of the joint here and uh, you measure to the very last tip of this bottom claw. So the propotis is essentially the immovable part of the claw. The only part that moves is this uh, top curvy area of the crusher and the pin or the pincer. Uh, and so uh, you can take calipers or crabbers often carry a, um, just a piece of metal that's pre-measured and you can just measure the length. Uh, so legal size claws are considered to be 73 millimeters or two and seven to eight inches if you prefer um, or greater in propotis length. And it is illegal to harvest claws from egg bearing females. Um, and the season is open from October 15th through May 1st. And I'll go into why exactly that's so specific uh, later on. So life history, let's, let's dive into that. There's, there's a lot to talk about. Um, a lot of the life history that we know uh, from stone crabs come from short-term field studies laboratory studies, some of which started back in the 60s. Um, well, currently there's no precise way to age a stone crab. It's believed that they may live to be up to seven or eight years. Um, though in populations that are fished, it's unlikely that many of these crabs reach this maximum age. Um, so these estimates are actually based on the frequency and increment of a crab's molt. And molting, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the process by which a crab grows in size, okay? so. Um, during the molt, a crab releases its shell or carapace, allowing the crab to grow. Uh, here in the bottom right, you can actually see a little, um, little fiddler crab. Um, and the carapace, as it's molting, splits right in the back where it's labeled breaking point. It kind of sloughs off its body, uh, almost as if it was taken off a helmet. Um, and molting occurs very frequently in juvenile crabs and decreases as the uh, crabs mature. Um, and molting actually usually occurs only about once a year in adults. All right, so mating. Um, uh, mature females usually mate in the fall, and mature males molt primarily in winter. And you might ask yourself, okay, why are females molting at different times than males? Um, well, after a molt, a crab's body is very soft and mushy. And this mushy post-molt period is the only time that the females can actually mate. Uh, so peak molting occurs in the winter time when chances of mating are uh, the lowest. So the takeaway here is that um, 
you know, molting facilitates not only the growth of these crabs, but it's extremely important in reproduction. And spawning occurs uh, generally between June and October uh, with some, uh, the season lengthening a little bit as you go further south. Um, the female crabs actually hang on to a crab's sperm throughout the winter, and then they may spawn multiple times throughout the spring and the summer. Um, so the reason uh, that stone crabs are not open to harvest earlier than October uh, is because by closing the harvest during the spring and summer when peak spawning occurs, it can reduce the stress on these crabs and their need to, um, you know, and when these crabs are trying to devote energy to reproduction, uh, the stress of being caught could be detrimental to that. Um, but again, uh, some of this, you know, uh, peak spawning, it, it varies by region, but um, that's why the season is closed when it is. Or yeah, varies by region, excuse me. Um, finally, going into the habitat, which honestly I find the most interesting about um, being a biologist and studying these stone crabs is learning more about their habitats. Um, stone crabs occupy a huge variety of habitats uh, from sand, which they might just uh, bury themselves in, uh, seagrass, shell hash. Small crabs often um, hide just in benthic biota. They'll, they'll find algae or you know little crevices where they can hide in. Larger crabs often dig burrows uh, and they'll burrow in, under a uh, seagrass bed. Uh, just like pictured in the middle here, dug himself a nice little tunnel, almost like a gopher tortoise. <laughs> um, and larger crabs also, also uh, excavate under rocks as well. So uh, I got this, this nice life cycle diagram courtesy of uh, Collier C. Grant. I, I thought that was, they did a good job. So uh, here we are uh, with a female in the top right. After she spawns, uh, she releases her eggs into the water column. Then the eggs float around and they hatch uh, within a couple weeks. Uh, they then become this uh, planktonic larval stage called a zoea, uh, a zoea, excuse me. As the zoea larvae grows, they pass through five distinct stages and then they'll develop into this post-larval form called a megalop. And so now they're no longer drifting around as a plankton. It, it's finally settled uh, to the sea floor, uh, but it isn't quite a stone crab yet. Um, here, it is actually going to molt several times uh, before transitioning into a juvenile stone crab. Okay, so now we've talked a little about, about um, stone crab life history, and I kind of want to uh, switch gears a little bit. Uh, and this slide um, highlights the most important takeaways from the 2001 stock assessment, not the most recent, but uh, there's some, some keywords here. So, it says the lack of a statewide fishery independent sampling program precludes examining the biological linkage between landings of claws and an underlying stock of crabs. And we also say that uh, landings have been level for the past decade, even though the number of traps in the fishery have doubled. So let's dissect that a little bit. Uh, what this is essentially saying is because only crab claws during this time were being harvested, uh, rather than the crabs themselves, and because during this time no biologists were really collecting data um, before the crabs were harvested, it was kind of impossible to get population estimates for the species because at the fish houses all you're really seeing are the claws. So uh, while we did have general life history, it was difficult to manage this fi fishery and get a true population estimate. Um, So again, while FWC has been conducting stone crab research for a long time, uh, since at least the 1980s, uh, these were often limited to short-term studies where we're really just trying to get a handle on, okay, you know, how, you know, what's the, you know, reproductive information for the species, what habitats do they like. Um, however, following the 2001 stock assessment, legislative funds were finally allocated toward a year-round stone crab sampling program. And as uh, the program grew, sites along the Gulf Coast, uh, as the program grew, sites along the Gulf Coast uh, were added. Now, as you can see here, uh, I mean, this is quite a large range to cover. And so they, uh, they instead of deploying biologists from a, a central location, uh, biologists are stationed at various locations along the entire coast and Keys region. Uh, so our, our, sampling, uh, our sampling areas include the Northwest, the Cedar Key area, 
uh, Central, where we have headquarters in St. Petersburg, Florida, the Southwest region down here, and then the Keys region. So um, now that we've talked a little about where we sample, uh, let's talk about where I sample from. So uh, I work again for the Southwest region um, and I'm located uh, with my partner at uh, Naples Field Office on Shell Island Road. Uh, it's a law enforcement station, but um, they're kind enough to share a space with us and let us keep our truck there and uh, are very accommodating. Uh, so here in Southwest Lab, we're also very lucky to have a very new, very nice boat. Uh, we have a 25-foot competitor by Latitude Tournament Boats. It was built in 2020. It's outfitted with a 300-horsepower Yamaha that gets us out to our sites pretty quickly. Uh, it has a Garmin chart plotter with bo bottom finder, but also side scan sonar. Um, and the boat is also outfitted with an electric uh, pot hauler, as you can see in the right of the picture here. So that's mounted on the stern. Um, and then along, uh, alongside the pot hauler on the stern, there's a foldable table directly adjacent. Okay, and this design allows us to basically come up at almost idle speed along a crab buoy, use a boat hook, and then we pull the trap line um, alongside the boat, uh, and then use the hauler to pull the trap up over a strike plate, and it just comes, it slides right up on the table most of the time. Um, and uh, we're able to work it up, you know, right at, uh, right at chest level. I also want to give a shout out to uh, the Collier County Sheriff's Department uh, because they're the ones who actually, uh, that, that's where we keep our boat uh, in, in the uh, Marco Island substation. And uh, they're kind enough to share that space as well and also share plenty of tools. Okay, so finally getting into the way our monitoring is set up. So you saw all those red squares in the previous slide. Uh, here I'm showing you the Northwest region. Uh, and each one of these, um, these squares here represents a different sampling location. Um, so within each of these sampling locations, we have what are called stations here on the right, okay? So the important takeaway here is that there's four stations at each one of these sampling locations. Uh, and each one of them uh, are located at different distances from shore. So if you look here in the, these uh, CK and HM, which stand for Cedar Key and Homa Sassa, um, you can see each one of these little lines represent a station at different distances from shore. Uh, so at each station, we have five traps. And so that in total for all four of these stations is, is 20 traps for the uh, site location. So. Uh, sampling location, you have 20 traps divided by four stations, each with five traps. So we service uh, these crab traps at each location every two weeks. Um, the traps themselves are outfitted with a special tag and uh, with, with numbers on them so we can identify them and they're placed at a very specific GPS location. Um, we also have buoys that are uh, attached to the trap which have an X um, which means it's a stone crab trap. Commercial crabbers use this same lettering. And then we also paint FWC on the trap as well. Um, a lot of times these traps are surrounded by commercial traps. So we try to make ours as distinctive as possible. Um, so we head offshore, uh, usually heading to the farthest station first around the 12 mile line. And then we look around to make sure all of our traps are there at the, at the GPS locations uh, where they're supposed to be. And then we start hauling traps. Um, and sometimes these traps aren't where they're supposed to be, okay? So they get jostled um, and we keep track of each trap using uh, a chart plotter um, so that when we're done collecting data, we can put the traps back where they go. So here pictured, you can see, uh, this is, these are our Sanibel lines, okay? So this will be station one uh, closest to the island, uh, line two, or station two, station three, station four. And then on the right here pictured is, uh, is the trap number on the chart plotter. And so whenever we pull up a trap, we open the chart plotter and say, yep, uh, that matches the tag on the trap. That's the right one. Okay, so um, to continue, um, so when we go out there, finally have the trap on board, um, we look at the stone crabs uh, and we record uh, a bunch of metrics that I'll go into. Uh, we record bycatch, 
And then once we do this, we release all the stone crabs overboard. Um, but we'll do that. Um, we first put them in a cooler um, and then travel uh, to our neck on the way, traveling to our next line, we'll release the crabs so that way they're not re-caught in the same traps we uh, used. Um, so the traps, uh, after we're done working out the crabs, they're baited with pig's feet, uh, which are very pleasant to work for, and especially in the summer days, we're all hot and gross. Um, and uh, then they're finally returned to the water. Uh, then uh, we also do something called scraping once a month that I'll go into more detail uh, later. But anyway, once a month, these traps are scraped of fouling organisms or stuff that gets on the outside of the traps and juvenile crab numbers are recorded. So the biological data, this is, this is, the, this is the heart of what we're doing. So once we get a trap on board, we take a variety of metrics. So the very first thing that we look at um, is the sex of the crab. Uh, so uh, pictured left over here, you can see someone measuring a claw, but you also see um, on the bottom, this, this indicates a male crab. It, it looks kind of like a tower uh, where a female uh, has kind of a round apron as pictured on the right. So the left one is a male, the right one is a female. Um, we also look at the reproductive state. So on these females, you'll notice that they have these colorful masses called sponges, okay? And those are essentially the eggs. Um, and the, the masses will change color uh, depending on how developed they are. So this orange mass right here is a relatively new egg mass. Um, these crabs are fertilized internally, but then they uh, store all these eggs in, a, in this big sponge under the apron here. So as the uh, eggs mature, they'll start to turn this really deep, dark brown color. And finally, when they're extremely close to hatching um, and are being released, uh, they'll turn this uh, kind of slate gray color. Uh, then we actually monitor molt condition as well. So uh, this ranges from if we catch a crab that's uh, mushy and is, is literally just molted, whether it's regular hard shell or whether it um, looks like it'll molt soon. And we can actually tell if this crab is, is going to molt soon in the field as well. Um, let's see here. Going into, and then uh, the fourth thing we look at is claw types, okay? So we actually, this is how we hold the crabs uh, when, we, uh, when we're working them up. So we'll grab the crab, we'll kind of flip the crab upside down like this. Uh, we'll say, okay, that's a male. And then we'll, um, you know, obviously not note the reproductive status then. Then we'll uh, start with the right side. We'll look at the claw over here and say, okay, uh, yep, that's a crusher claw, that's original. Um, and then we'll look over here and say, yep, that's a pincer claw and that's original. Meaning that uh, it's the original claw, it's not been broken off in the past, not regenerated. Oops. Uh, okay, and then both claws are measured uh, as is the width of the carapace up here. So uh, going back to the original versus regenerated. Um, so uh, let's see. So on the left here, you can see um, these little lines. Okay, and so that, that's, that's what we're looking for when we're just holding the crab. We're looking for these lines that are not broken. Uh, and that tells us that this clause has never been broken either by uh, harvest or by another crab. Um, and uh, over on the right side, you'll see these little hash marks. And that'll indicate that the um, that it has been broken in the past. Um, so the the really interesting thing that a lot of people don't realize is that um, so a new pincer, um, if a if a crusher claw is broken um, before regenerating a new claw, the uh, pincer claw that was left on the crab will actually morph into the crusher claw over over a series of molts. Okay, so. Cross your claws broken, the pincer's still there, and that pincer is going to completely change. Okay. And um, so it'll develop these big molars that you see in these big, big crushers that are used to uh, crush gastropods and, and uh, all sorts of little um, you know, snails and things like that. And then it'll grow this, this tiny little pincer claw on the other side. But once they do grow large, we can look again at these, uh, these little hash marks and, and when they're smaller size too, uh, within reason. And uh, Look at the status of those. All right, so here's a little video just to, to get you out on the boat and uh, kind of show you what it's like out there. These are actually, uh, this is a video from 
the uh, our colleagues in the Keys who came up to help me when I was shorthanded. So, so here you can see Leah handling uh, stone crab like a pro. Um, Sometimes uh, we will measure these claws just by ourselves, like she's doing. Um, but more often than not, uh, most groups will um, hold it just like Bailey is there and then hold out each claw uh, so that they can be measured and data can be taken. But put our hands in a lot of crab traps. Okay, so this, this is what to me is most exciting and, and why, why I really like my job. This, this is going into kind of the the habitat trap data realm, okay? So um, what I wanna talk about here is something called fouling. Now you see how gross this trap is, um, but uh, fouling in a way lets us know uh, kind of what is on the bottom or the habitat types that we might be setting in. Um, and for this reason, we quantify how much fouling we get on the outside of the trap. Um, you know, we might get things like encrusting bryozoans, um, algaes, barnacles, all, all sorts of things. But the fouling is also really cool because it attracts juvenile stone crabs, uh, like this one pictured in the bottom right. Um, so once a month, we uh, do what's called a scrape day. We use hatchets and we'll actually uh, flip the trap over on its side and we'll just start scraping all that gross stuff off. And as we do that, we're noting these tiny little juveniles that may be falling off uh, and they'll be crawling around on the table and we're counting each and every one of them. Um, and this is, is really just as important as um, measuring these, these large crab claws because um, counting these little juvenile crabs in this way has proven to be a very good predictor of future legal size crab catches. Okay, so, um, you know, much like um, trying to sample juvenile fishes one way and uh, larger another with different size nets and so on, with the trap, we're really able to sample uh, all size classes, which I just think is, is really cool. Um, let's see here. So getting into a little, uh, well, some really, really fun stuff. So we, we do ca catch a, a lot of bycatch. Um, I, I'm previously a fish guy, so I love the fishes. I mean, these are just kind of a, a sample of the stuff we get. Occasionally we get these uh, juvenile nurse sharks um, and all sorts of little blennies. This is a juvenile hogfish. Um, we recently got a, a really cool oscillated frogfish. Um, that, was, that was a really neat one. Um, and then this um, short big eye, which was, was a pretty cool find. But of course we have to give love to, uh, to our inverts as well. Um, we catch a decent amount of octopus depending on the, uh, the region. Um, so you can actually see that one right next to a stone crab. I just realized that. Um, we catch plenty of urchins, a peppermint shrimp, all sorts of different crabs. Uh, actually, for, for those of you who are shellers out there, uh, this is a Junonia, which is a pretty prized shell. And Thomas was lucky enough to, uh, to get this up in his trap and, and see it. So that was pretty cool. Of course, it had a hermit crab in it. So, but uh, pre pretty neat. Okay, so uh, another uh, important piece of data that we collect out there is water quality. Um, we all know how important that is, especially down here. Um, so in fishery science, it's standard to take water quality in addition to your biological data. Um, this tool, uh, the tool used for this is, off, is called the water quality sonic. And with it, you can tell how much dissolved oxygen in the water there is, there, how, well, what the salt content is, water temperature, among other things. And you're able to do this at a very precise location. Um, so pairing this information with fisheries data is important because it can give you a better picture of what's going on at the time of sampling. Um, temperature is, is a very important thing for stone crabs. Um, and that's a very important cue. Um, dissolved oxygen readings are important because they can tell us if there's enough oxygen on the bottom for crabs to survive. Um, so to that end, um, you know, that, that can also be indicative of red tide conditions if, if we're trying to, um, you know, keep an eye out for that, see if that's affecting our catches. And uh, to that end, we actually collect at least two water samples at each location to assist with FWC's harmful algal bloom mapping efforts. You can see the bottles pictured here. So um, even you know, before and after uh, we're servicing our traps, we, 
we have uh, a lot to do just main, maintaining um, you know, all of our gear. Um, we spend a fair amount of time assembling new traps, uh, pouring concrete to weigh them down. On the right here, you'll, you'll see that. Um, we actually write FWC into the concrete and we even put the year that the traps were deployed uh, just so we can uh, you know, have a better idea of you know, in case traps get lost and, um, and when they need to be replaced. Um, let's see, and then we also have, uh, this is my partner Thomas right here, hard at work painting buoys, which we also do a fair amount of. Um, here you can also see what's called our, our data logger. So when we're recording all this biological data, we bring this little computer out into the field and we're actually typing everything in rather than using paper. Um, and then when we get back from the field, we have to upload this data to our data manager um, for analysis. Um, and then it, I'm sure Thomas will agree with me that I, I would say our probably our, our uh, most common duty is watching the weather. Uh, this is both because we want to find the best weather days to head offshore, but also because the cold fronts that we get this time of year uh, often blow our traps far away from their station, uh, sometimes a half a mile or more. Um, so we're about keeping track of the wind direction, the sea state when we're off the water, that can save us a lot of time on the water. Just that way we, you know, when we're heading out to the sites, we can say, hey, we've had a north wind that's been really persistent. Like maybe let's approach these traps from the, from the south and see if they've blown that way. Uh, and this is another big reason that we have the GPS points in the chart plotter and keep track of numbers on the traps and so on. Um, so of course, if we don't find them, they have to be replaced. Okay, so new projects. Um, so last year, um, uh, we, I had some talk with my supervisor and we kind of wanted to address this, uh, this gap that we've had in central Florida. Uh, you know, uh, we, there used to be a um, dedicated station off Tampa Bay and it, with, you know, uh, a lot of data in the past. Um, but for various reasons, uh, that was uh, discontinued and other sites were set up in other locations. Um, but we wanted to address this year-round gap in monitoring in the Central Florida region. We also had a second goal in mind, though. Um, so currently, we sample over a variety of habitats like sand, aquatic vegetation, uh, occasionally some low relief hard bottom. Think, when I say hard bottom, think, um, you know, rubble and marine vegetation grown over it. That's what I mean by low relief. Just, um, and then earlier uh, we talked about how large stone crabs tend to excavate under, you know, rocky areas, okay? But uh, to our knowledge, we don't think that we sample uh, over those kinds of habitats uh, a great degree. Um, and as commercial boats, start to push into deeper waters to find crabs, uh, where, the, where those rockier habitats tend to occur, it's important that our program sample those kind of areas as well. All right, so to do this, uh, we work with our partners um, in uh, uh, the Research Institute in St. Pete uh, to acquire side scan sonar data, okay? So uh, side scan sonar data is, is a kind of sonar that shoots out diagonally from the boat and it gives you an extremely fine resolution of what's on the bottom. Um, other uh, offshore monitoring efforts done by FWC um, have uh, allowed them to collect a vast amount of data on uh, reefs and low relief and rocky, all, all sorts of habitats. So we pull on those partners um, specifically on regions where we thought, hey, we want to find some rocky habitat uh, right here. So uh, let, let's go in the areas we haven't sampled yet and look for that kind of habitat. Okay, and then after we took that data, um, uh, we imported it into a geospatial mapping software, okay? And then we just looked for areas where uh, the sites can discover those ha uh, rocky habitats. Uh, and then all that was left to do was verify that the hard bottom was still there since 2019, which was um, the year that we got uh, most of the site scan data. Uh, it was all 2019, 2020 data, I believe. But we went out there with our own boat, scanned it and made sure, yep, there's, there's some habitat here. And then all that was left to do was, was draw out the map for, for each of our stations, okay? Um, so then we, uh, this is, uh, I believe, off uh, John's Pass right here. Um, so yeah, this, this was a whole effort to not only expand the monitoring program and, and make it more comprehensive, but also uh, to see uh, if crabs were occupying these other habitats as well. So, 
Uh, in 2021, we were able to add uh, two more sampling locations, one in Johns Pass and the other in Englewood. Uh, so now we're, we're officially covering the entire west coast of Florida uh, in a year-round monitoring program as, as was intended uh, or hoped for um, in that 2001 stock assessment. So uh, we're really proud of that. And then uh, perhaps even more exciting uh, is the new tagging project that's being spearheaded down in the Florida Keys. Uh, so for years, uh, the Stone Crab Research Group has experimented with tagging crabs in an effort to learn about where they're moving and how far they move in a season. Um, but the challenge to doing this is that uh, most tags would just fall off the crabs when they molt, right? Because they take their carapace off, they, they molt their entire body, it becomes squishy. So that tag's not gonna stay there. Um, and this would make it nearly impossible to learn where the crabs move. So uh, after much experimentation, um, the Keys group found success by tagging the crabs in this area, right where the carapace splits. Okay, so uh, that way the tag isn't removed as soon as uh, that carapace slops off. Um, so the tag will remain here even after a molt. Uh, and since late 2021, 20, uh, when we started tagging, over, over 500 crabs have been tagged and three tags have been returned one from a commercial crabber and the other from our own biologists. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. I mean, three out of 500 or, you know, or more, it seems like a pretty low return rate, but actually it's, it's pretty darn encouraging considering the very short time we've been tagging uh, these crabs. And it's, it's very hard to get um, people to report tag crabs in a lot of fisheries um, like these. And uh, so it's, it's pretty encouraging so far. Um, and in addition, we're already getting our first glimpses of how far these crabs travel. Um, Picture on the left, you'll see some of these returns, um, so indicated by the red dots. And then these green here are the uh, sampling locations in the Keys. Um, and one of these crabs um, traveled seven miles in only about 16 days. Um, so that's pretty cool. I mean, we're already getting information about, uh, about these movements. Um, and by tagging these crabs, we hope to get more information, uh, the more crabs we tag about, um, you know, mass movements that we think occur in the Gulf and mass migrations of, of these animals uh, seasonally. So pretty cool stuff. Oops, too far. And then, so what to do if you catch a, a tag stone crab? Um, shout out to Leah and her, and her really cool t-shirt. Um, so she, she has some very fancy t-shirts for those who catch and report a tag stone crab. Um, when reporting the tag, um, you make sure to include the four digit tag number, the latitude and longitude that um, you see on the tag, the date of capture, and of course the shirt size that you'd like and where to send it. Um, and then you make your report by calling the tag return hotline up here, or you can email at uh, tag return at myfwc.com. And that's also listed on the tag. So, okay. Any questions? My name's John. It was that was a really really interesting talk, and really appreciate that. Um, can you can you talk about the data on the commercial fishery side? You said um, in two thousand one, it showed it was stable. Is what I I got that was oh, the impression okay. I got. And then what's uh, been okay. happening since then in terms of the the catch and how they're feeling about managing it as a resource. Got it, got it. So yeah, so um, there, there's been um, numerous stock assessments since that 2001 report. Uh, and the reason I include that one in particular is, is just because that, that really was, um, you know, the first one that said, hey, um, in order to manage this population better, we need year round uh, sampling. We need comprehensive sampling. And, um, but as, as far as, um, as I said earlier, the, the fishery really peaked in the 1990s. And because we have, um, you know, because the state has these fail safes in place and that we can't harvest uh, claws from the, uh, you know, ovigorous or egg bearing females because we have these minimum claw size limits, um, really the, the population has remained stable. However, it's, it's steadily decreased over time. So in other words, uh, because the season's closed when the crabs are primarily reproducing uh, and you can't take the claws when they're too young, that kind of protects the population from being able to crash, 
Okay, so uh, there's there's enough fail safes in place that even with this steady decline, this really uh, slow decline of crab numbers, as you know, we get more crabbers, more traps out in the water. Um, the fail safes kind of are protecting, uh, you know, uh, from a collapse. But it is true that uh, there are much the fish. Uh, the stone crabs are being overfished and overfishing is occurring uh, because there's far more traps in the water than, uh, than there are crabs. So the population really hasn't been able to um, overcome, uh, hasn't been able to grow past a certain point. There's, so I hope that answers your question. It's almost like you can think about a set population of crabs and then uh, just way too much fishing pressure, but because you're not taking away the pregnant females or taking away, you know, this, this growing juveniles and so on. Um, it's still relatively stable. It's, it's an interesting situation. How long does it take them to grow back the claw? The claw? Yeah. So that, that depends on, um, that kind of depends on how old the stone crab is. It can take, you know, several molts, you know, and I, I mentioned that stone crabs, the mature ones generally molt uh, once a year or so. So you're looking at, you know, several molds for, for it. But uh, when we're out there, we see plenty of legal size regenerated claws. So, um, you know, it, we definitely know for a fact that even, even with claw loss, um, you know, there's, um, there's a chance of them getting back into the fishery, but it, it does take a long time. Um, so if a, crab, if a crab loses its claw when it's younger, it's, and, uh, it's gonna grow that claw faster because it molts much more often than an adult crab, so. When you showed the, um, the babies, <laughs> it made me wonder, what are their natural predators? Ooh, oh my goodness, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would assume, uh, I would assume everything, <laughs> I mean, uh, fish, other crabs, re really anything that, uh, um, you know, can fit them in their mouth. I, I um, you know, they, they're so small though, and they, but they are growing so fast, um, you know, based on their behavior of hiding in these little crevices that, that we see them doing on the traps and in habitats, um, you know, they're, they're hiding from predators. So, um, but luckily, you know, when they, when they grow and get those pincers, they're able to defend themselves better. But um, I think hiding is their best strategy at that size. Oh yeah, so that is a great question. Um, so since we added that new Englewood site, um, that I'm current, Thomas and I are currently covering uh, four different locations. We're, we're covering, um, I should have mentioned this, but we cover um, Marco Island, Sanibel, Pavilion Key down by Everglades National Park, and then Englewood, um, north of uh, the Charlotte Harbor area. And uh, Englewood, Englewood's got some really deep water. That's that's uh, probably one of the two deepest sites. Actually, John's Pass is, is fairly deep too. Uh, the deepest depth that we sample right now is around 60 feet. Um, and uh, you know that that's off Englewood. Off of Sanibel and Marco Island, we're in about 45 feet deepest. Uh, and then Pavilion Key uh, for the south uh, is only about 20 feet deep. So we're covering a huge range of depths. And the, and the commercial crabbers do go out farther than, than we sample sometimes. They're starting to push, you know, especially far. But um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely getting into the deep water with these newest sites. So thank you very much for having me. I had a great time.